Well, good morning. My name is Robin Miller, and I'm lead pastor here at Church of the Shepherd. And just want to welcome all of you who are here this morning as we worship and those who are joining us online. It is indeed a beautiful day to praise and worship God. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Um, Back a couple of months ago, it was just in May, but it already feels like moons ago, uh, some of the staff and some of the ministry leaders on various teams within the church, we went to a leadership conference uh, in the area that was sponsored by Chick-fil-A. Maybe you've heard of that restaurant before. And one of the first speakers of the day was my very favorite speaker and and pastor. Um, His name is Andy Stanley. And Andy, you know, God bless him, he tries. He's got this little bitty church in Atlanta called North Point. Now, if you're not familiar with him, I don't know, they got something like 25,000 members. So just a little smaller than us, but uh, not, not much, right? And, and so what I've come to really love and admire about Andy is his approach to leadership. He is, he is just spot on in his style and in his, the way he tackles that. And on that particular morning, he spoke about the importance of knowing what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. And, you know, for many of us, it's like, well, duh, yeah. But, you know, as I thought about it, how many times do I go through my day not really knowing exactly what I'm doing and certainly not knowing why I'm doing it. And so he talked about how he spent months with his staff. And they've got a really big staff there at North Point. But uh, they went through an exercise where each person, they boiled down their job description to one sentence descriptions. Um, and, and he said that was a great exercise because when things get hectic and crazy, um, knowing what that one thing is that you absolutely have to do and need to do, he said it really helps you to kind of keep your focus. Now, it's not the only thing that you do or the only important thing you do, but that is the, the top. That is the most important. So of all of the tasks that you do have to do, you know, in a day or a week or a year, knowing what that one thing is kind of helps you accomplish. And so, you know, if all the other stuff, if it's driving that main point, then you're going to be all the more successful. And so I think the reason that one idea really resonated with me, um, it, it, it was for lots of reasons, you know, first, like me or like you guys, I'm sure, um, you know, you, you kind of have a to-do list like mine. And usually my to-do list is way bigger than my day. And uh, so I, I really tapped in for that reason. But I think the real reason this grabbed me so much is because the idea of a one-line job description just, it, it really gets to the heart of what you're doing and why you're doing it. In other words, purpose. And if we're really honest with ourselves, purpose is, you know, something we struggle with from time to time. You know, there's that great question we all, you know, hear asked often in in and through culture, not just in the church, but, you know, why am I here? You know, it's a question we want an answer to that. And, and it's not just in an existential context that we kind of wonder, you know, the meaning of life and our part in it. But we, we also ask that question when we're in a church setting. You know, why are we here? Why are we at Church of the Shepherd? What is our purpose as a gathered community? Now, you know, for some of you, uh, maybe you are here this morning and you're pretty new to church. Um, you know, and maybe you're struggling with, you know, finding your way in the church or in a way with a relationship with God. Um, those are big struggles and important ones to have. Maybe you're even wondering, you know, what is it I'm supposed to do with my life and, and how does the church kind of fit in to all of that? So valid struggles, um, or maybe you're not new to church. Maybe you've been around here for a while, but you find yourself still struggling with to know, you know, how is it that God has gifted me, which God has gifted us all in some way, but how has God gifted me and how can I use those gifts to, you know, make a difference in this world? So that question, what am I doing here, is really one that just permeates 
so many facets of our lives. Well, our job is, is plain. Leading people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And as far as the kingdom goes, that is the most important thing we can do. And, and actually, there was a man named Paul who kind of outlined this for us. Um, uh, Paul, we're going to read something he wrote today. Paul was an apostle. He was a follower of, of Jesus Christ, and uh, he wrote many letters to various churches throughout, one of which being to the church of Ephesus, which we're going to read about that today. And so he's writing to these people, and Paul was kind of a missionary, if you will. He was kind of Christianity's very first missionary. He went from Israel, and he went to all corners of the world, or to lots of them, um, to spread the message, the good news of Jesus Christ, to, to others who had never heard it before. People who had never heard of Christ, much less the grace that comes from our relationship there. So he went to countries like Ephesus, and sometimes when he did, um, and he preached about Jesus... On occasion, it would land him in jail, you know, because people didn't want to hear about this new God. They, they had their own God, and you don't talk bad about our other God or gods. So he found himself in jail. That's where we find him today in our scripture. So I'm going to invite you to join with me. Ephesians is the book we're going to be reading from, chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. Now, what I'm going to read out of is the message version. It's just a different translation than what uh, is in the seat backs in front of you. If you want to follow along with the Bible, uh, the one you have in the backs of the chairs, it's found on page 1412. So uh, again, different translations. The words are a little different, but the, the idea is there and it's still the same. And we'll also have it on the screens as well. So hear these words from Paul talking to the people of Ephesus. <clears throat> This is why I, Paul, am in jail for Christ, having taken up the cause of you outsiders, so-called. I take it you're familiar with the part I was given in God's plan for including everybody. I got the inside story on this from God himself, as I just wrote you in brief. And as you read over what I've written to you, you'll be able to see for yourselves into the mystery of Christ. None of our ancestors understood this. Only in our time has it been made clear by God's spirit through his holy apostles and prophets of this new order. So let me stop there for just a minute. Now, again, in the translation I'm reading in the message, Paul has this kind of strange um, insider outsider language going on here. So, you know, he says that he's taken up the cause for the people of Ephesus who he calls outsiders, right? And, and so what he means by that is outsiders were people in his mind who would have traditionally been considered outside of God's covenant or God's promise, okay? So that's what he means by that. So if you're familiar with the Old Testament, especially in the first five books, we learn the story of God's covenant with God's people of Israel, how God saved them and brought them into the promised land. But then as we go uh, further on, especially into the New Testament, we, we learn that through Christ, God made a new promise. And so it wasn't just to the people who were Jewish, uh, but it was to all people. And, and so Paul, he's sharing this news and he's telling the people of Ephesus, he goes, now you can see for yourselves into this mystery of Christ. And mystery, you know, again, kind of a, a, a little bit of an interesting word to use. And by mystery, we're not talking about like a whodunit kind of mystery. Um, what Paul is referring to is something great. It's actually good news. And so we hear him expand on that in, in uh, verse se uh, 6. He says, the mystery is that people who have never heard of God and those who have heard him all their lives, what I've been called, I've been calling outsiders and insiders. You see the difference? He's talking about the Jews, Jewish people and the non-Jewish people, the people of Israel, the people of Ephesus, the people who go to church all the time, the people who have never 
walk through the doors of a church. So all of those people stand on the same ground before God. They get the same offer, same help, same promises in Christ Jesus. The message is accessible and welcoming to everyone across the board. So this would have been brand new for the people of Ephesus, for all of the outsiders, for that matter. Um, And the mystery that was revealed to Paul that he is sharing, you know, that is that God wasn't content to let anybody, to, to let anyone fall outside of that relationship. God wanted everyone to be included. And through Christ, God acted uh, it, it, to, to bring everybody into a relationship. And that includes us. I mean, we all have access to that grace. That was the mystery. I mean, this is, this is something that's for the insiders and the outsiders. This is, you know, something for those who grew up uh, hearing the name of, of God all the time and those who are hearing it for the very first time. And what Paul is saying in this letter to the people of Ephesus is that now this is yours. You can have this. I mean, never before had these people heard a message quite like this. And, and, and if Paul had, if he ever had a one-line job description, this had to be it. Listen to what he says next as we finish up in verse 7. This is my life work. Helping people understand and respond to this message. It came as a sheer gift to me. A real surprise. God handling all the details. This is the word of God for the people of God. So this was an amazing declaration for Paul to say that this is now my life work to help people understand and respond to this message. And the reason that is, is because this wasn't always Paul's job. Uh, Paul used to be a persecutor of Christians. In fact, he was kind of like enemy number one for Christianity. But then he met Christ. And he he had this amazing experience of, of grace and mercy. And it was after that his, his job changed drastically. I, I mean, after that encounter with Christ, Paul, he became just laser focused on what it was he had to do. Yeah, you know, Paul knew, he knew that uh, Israel was, was God's chosen people and, and, and God had, had, had brought them to that promised land. But he also knows that, that God didn't stop there. He knows now that through the person, through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, a plan was unveiled for all of us to be able to be in a relationship with God. And this was good news. This was grace. Now, Paul referred to it as the mystery of Christ. That mystery being that we all now stand on the same ground before God. And and can you imagine the amazement uh, of the people in Paul's day hearing this message for the first time? You know, maybe some people thinking, you know, you, you mean the heathens? Do you mean those people who have never, uh, you know, followed the law of the Old Testament? Those people who have never been in the temple? Those people who have never sacrificed? They, they, they stand now on the same ground? And Paul said, yep. That is the mystery of Christ. The mystery of God's love and God's grace. That God could and and would and did and does love the Jewish law-abiding faithful and the idol-worshipping Ephesians exactly the same. That would have been huge. 
but it was also hard. I mean, it was it was hard for people to understand that radical hospitality of of God. And, and it's hard today for us as well. I mean, it, it's hard to sometimes wrap your head and your heart around the fact that, you know, God loves those on death row and, and those on skid row and those who lie and those who cheat and those who steal exactly the same as God loves anyone. I mean, at the, at the very heart of who God is, is this invitation for For those who know full well who God is and for those who have never heard his name, the offer is exactly the same and it's completely independent of our behavior in the past. Now, you might be sitting here this morning and you're hearing this, maybe for the very first time, maybe you've never heard that message of grace. And perhaps you're thinking, you know, this... This just sounds too good to be true. You know, maybe you're thinking if you if you only knew what I did when I was a teenager. If you only knew what I did in my adult years, if you only knew what I did last night. You know, if you knew how I've hurt my uh, my my husband, if you know how I've hurt my kids, or if you've known how I hurt my parents, you know, I, I maybe you're thinking I can see where where God might love the people at least who try. But there have been periods in my life when I didn't, you know, much less try. I I didn't even care. And so you're saying that God loves and offers grace to me as well? This offer of grace, it, it comes through God. Not through our worthiness of it. Thanks be to God. And I know that. Paul knew that. And you need to know that too. Because when you know that, when you understand and you respond to that amazing message, that mystery of Christ, that grace, it'll change you. You know, I had a pretty dramatic experience with Christ. Um, It was one where one day I was... A person who was kind of how I would say it, living outside that grace. And then the very next, I was a completely different person because of that experience with Christ. I mean, it was an overnight thing. It was extremely profound. And from that point forward, it changed me to the very core of who I am. And I've shared this with some of you that, you know, uh, in order to become an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church, one of the things we have to do is we have to interview with other clergy. And so I'm just beginning the process. I'm in a room filled with other clergy. It was quite intimidating, I must say. And I remember one of the pastors looking me straight in the eye and he said, Robin, why do you want to do this? And with almost no hesitation whatsoever... I said, because I want others to know grace. You know, I I knew firsthand in my own life what grace can do to a person. And and so if there were any people out there like me, kind of living without that experience of grace, I wanted them to have it. Because I knew that it would change them. I knew that it would give them hope. And so that was my answer then, and it is still my answer today. That's why I do what I do. I want to be part of the process of grace in some way. If I want to partner with the Holy Spirit in any way I can to help people experience that grace. I mean, in fact, you know, that's, it was out of that experience that I had that our, our mission and our vision here at Church of the Shepherd was born. Paul's life work, my life work, our life work is plain. Leading people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And for the kingdom, there is nothing more important than we can do. You know, really, it's the Great Commission. 
I, I think Paul just kind of said it a little differently. Uh, the Great Commission is kind of the, the couple of verses at the very end of Matthew's gospel. And it's after Jesus has risen from the dead, but before he ascends into heaven, he's sitting down. He's having a conversation with his disciples and he issues them a challenge. He tells them, I want you guys to go and I want you to go into all nations. And he didn't say, I just want you to go into the nation of Israel. I just want you to go to people who are worthy of it. I just want you to go to people who already know my name. Jesus said, I want you to go into all nations. And I want you to help them become my disciples. I want you to help them understand and respond to this message of grace. And that was not just a challenge for the disciples. It stands today as a challenge for us. Our job is plain. Leading people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is why we're here. The question is, are you willing to accept that job? You know, are you willing to respond to this awesome message that each and every one of us, we stand on the same ground. This message that grace is both accessible and welcoming. Will you respond to that and in turn help others understand it and respond to it as well? I mean, my dear friends, this news, this Mystery, this grace of God is something that is too good for us to keep to ourselves. Let me just kind of maybe put this in a little uh, current context for us. And talking about news that's too good to keep to ourselves, think about it in this way. What if, what if Steve Jobs never shared his inventions with anyone. Hmm? We would all be walking around with telephones and these big long lines hanging behind us, right? I mean, what if he'd never shared that? Or at least that's what I'd be doing. Or put in another way, what if, what would your life be like if Thomas Edison decided he wasn't going to share his findings? Right? Right? <laughs> We'd need some candles. Or what if Jonas Salk, the inventor of the vaccine for polio, what if he said, you know, maybe it's just better if this stays with me. And then some of you, some of you are here this morning as a direct result of someone sharing the gospel message with you. I mean, think about that for just a minute. What if that person at that point in your life had decided the news was something they wanted to keep just for them? Where would you be? The good news of God's grace is life-giving. It is too good to keep to ourselves. In fact, it is our job to share it, to help people understand and respond. It is leading people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. You know, in many ways, I feel like I have been Paul. Yeah, I've had a job. I've had this uh, um, a deep experience with grace and Jesus Christ. And after that, my job description changed. My life work became helping others experience that same grace that I felt. My life work has become to lead others into a relationship with Christ. And in the words of John Newton, the writer of that famous hymn, Amazing Grace, he said, I am a great sinner and Christ is a great sinner. Savior. And that is the best news I have ever heard. 
Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, just simply the word grace rings in our ears. We hear the awesome news and then we also realize how often we turn away from this free gift that you have offered. And so God, in the spirit of this moment, help us not only to maybe grasp this message, maybe for the very first time, but help us to do something with it. We give you thanks, God, for the gift that you offered through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen.